now we move into spiritual warfare, and this is the, this is the part I like. Because all of your anointing should be leading you to present the army of God in a powerful force to push back the powers of darkness. Because once we go through spiritual boot camp for overcomers and we personally clean up our own space, our own soul, and we now become effective holders or vessels for the anointing, God's anointing comes in us and then we are beginning to now partnership with Him in the work of the ministry. And so what's on your screen for ministry will be in, intensely um, uh, magnified when it comes to spiritual warfare. Because now uh, there are consequences for everything you say and do. Because there is an enemy that dislikes you greatly who's trying to rob, steal, and destroy, trying to kill you. And so you need to know about the armor of God, the protection of God, the sword of God, the warfare that we're, we're engaging in. And so we want to get into this subject now and uh, get some foundational scriptures and, and dig in. <clears throat> All followers of Christ are called to take positions of attack in this war with the enemy of our faith. God has equipped us to engage in these battles, protected by His provided armor, with eyes wide open and following what's on your screen for ministry. Jesus Christ is the field marshal, <clears throat> that is directing the Holy Spirit-led forces to bring about the final judgment of Satan at His second coming. We are blessed to be able to participate at our appointed level of authority as we get revelation and marching orders for specific overcoming assignments. That was a mouthful, but that's what spiritual warfare is all about. We are here for a reason. Right. So let's talk about why we have an anointing to do the work of the ministry. Well, let, let me give a foundational scripture here. Um, Ephesians 6.12 in the Amplified Version says, We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So all of those conflicts you're having aren't about people. There's something else in the background that's affecting that conflict, that's creating that conflict. So we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. So there's a battle, and it's, it's being performed out there. We may not always see what's going on, but we know and see and discern the effects of this battle. And so as we begin to see the physical manifestation of this, of this battle that's being waged against us personally, we are to take up the full armor of God and begin to wage warfare. Now, part of that warfare comes because we, we recognize Christ's authority in our lives, and we know that He is the name above all names, as Colossians 2, 19 through, 9 through 10 tells us, that in Him is the fullness of the Godhead. And He is in us, and because He is in us, He's given us the power and authority to act on His behalf. All things that we have have been given to us by the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ and are enacted by the Holy Spirit in us and through us. So Ephesians 1.21 tells us that all things have been placed under Christ's authority because of the work that He completed at the cross. So if we are Christ's followers, He's given us that authority to act in His name. So that means that we need to know that we've been, when we've been called to act in His name and when we've been called to, to enact warfare. And what does the warfare look like? And how do we perform this warfare? How do we go about doing it? Is what we're, we'll be talking about in this next segment. All right, Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. <clears throat> Jesus came up and said to them, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of, and of the Holy Spirit. So in Matthew 28, Jesus is telling them all authority. What's the Greek word? Exus all authority. Exousia. Exousia. How about for 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28? After that comes the end or completion, when he hands over the kingdom of God, kingdom to God the Father. This is God, Jesus Christ himself being under 
authority of, of the Father. So he hands the kingdom over to God the Father after he has made inoperative and abolished every ruler and every authority and power. For Christ must reign as king until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished and put to death, put to an end is death. For he the Father has put all things in subjection under his feet. For he has said, all things have been put in subjection under Christ. So it's clear that the Father has put all things under, the, under Christ. And the Father expects now that we as Christ's servants would be functioning in that same authority. Because he has given that authority to Christ. And Christ has now given us that authority to, to operate on his behalf and that's why he says that we are ambassadors for Christ as though Christ himself were working through us. So previously we said you can't go outside the bounds of your authority you can't go uh, outside of your boundaries so it's very very important here to understand who you are in Christ uh, what giftings have been given to you you need to know all the things about what's on your screen uh, what is the anointing that you are operating by? What's the anointed calling that you have? Uh, are you discerning properly? And you do have to discern these things, uh, especially going into warfare. You have to count the cost before you go to war. You can't just run into war and get beat uh, because your strategy was wrong. You need to know the gifts and callings. You need to know exactly what God has put in you. And then you need to have faith, believing that these things have been put together in a package with the word of God in full power, and you are coming out with sword blazing. Not uh, a defenseless, armorless person, but you have the armor of God, you have the sword of the Spirit, you know the word, and then you are expecting the Spirit of God to show you by what's on your screen. What do you now do to engage in this? Now, you know, we have to take on Christ's humility, humility at this point because. Uh, he's a, in a highly exalted position, and yet he's submitted to the Father. In Philippians 2, 9 and 10, it says, For this reason also, because he obeyed and so completely humbled himself, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in submission of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So, all power is in the name of Jesus. Uh, the battle is at large, and we are on the correct side. Praise the That's Lord. Right, amen. And we are now going to follow what's on our screen for ministry, because once you have been put in a position, once you have been anointed to do a certain thing, God is expecting you to do it. And that is our act of humility, uh, our act of, of complete obedience. So Luke 10 19 says, listen carefully. I have given you authority that you now possess to tread on serpents and scorpions and the ability to exercise authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will in any way harm you. So he wasn't speaking here to the disciples that they were to go around and play with serpents or play with scorpions. But he was saying that he'd given them authority over all of the kingdom. Over all those things that they needed to have authority over. And that nothing would harm them as they were in God's plan and purpose for their life. So John 14, 2 says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, anyone who believes in me as Savior will also do the things that I do. And he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So that was Jesus' plan. Not that the work would stop with him, but the work would continue through us. And spiritual warfare was a big part of it. That's what Jesus did when he went into, into the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't speak his own word. He spoke the word of God. He said, it is written. And so for us, the written part of the word tells us that we have authority over all the works of the enemy. So as Paul did, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave that particular servant 
girl that he was speaking to. So in the name of Jesus, we have authority over all the works of darkness, over all the works of the enemy that come into our sphere of influence. And we were talking about that early. That's our boundary. Our boundaries are our sphere of influence. We're not called to go beyond that. Paul didn't preach the gospel to the entire world, but there was a very uh, large segment of, of the world that he did preach the gospel to. And the gospel came to the Gentiles as a result of Paul's ministry. And so now the gospel has been spread out throughout most of the world. I believe that's one of the things that is still that still needs to happen. The gospel needs to be preached to all of the world. So there are some indigenous tribes that haven't heard the gospel yet. And I believe until they've all had the opportunity to hear that Christ will not be not return until that has happened. So we were talking here about delegated authority. Exousia is the Greek word. Uh, Jesus has all authority and, and all power has been given to him. It's in his name. And so now he has allowed us now to use this name. He's allowing us to delegate this delegated power and authority that he's given us. He's allowing us to use this in this war, in this battle. So let's talk about the 12 disciples. Uh, they were actually given instructions in Matthew 10, 1. Uh, and it was a pretty big call. You know, he pulls them together in Matthew 10, 1 and says, <clears throat> He gave them authority and power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. That's Matthew 10, 1. So they were in, given an anointing. They were giving a directive because of this power level. Now, Jesus was still on earth and was not in a resurrected state yet, but obviously, it said in one scripture that he could call all the army of heaven down if he wanted mm -hmm. to, because he was still God, okay? So his anointing was without measure. There was, no, there was no limit to his anointing. He was operating in full anointing. So he, as an anointed one, could do whatever he wanted, basically. But he only did what the Father said. So this authority in Jesus' name, let's, let's go into this a little deeper. Okay, so... All deliverance, all healing, all miracles, and all power is authoritatively delivered through the name of Jesus Christ. There isn't anything that we have authority to do uh, in Christ's name apart from his authority. There, we have examples in the New Testament of, of how some got in trouble for you, trying to use the name of Christ without being uh, born again. So that, that's the beginning of our authority in Christ. And as we submit to that authority, of course, our ability to walk in that becomes stronger. Part of that authority then, as, as we've talked about in, in Mark 16, 17, that these signs shall accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons and they will speak in new tongues. Also says that they will lay hands upon the sick and they shall be healed. That's something that, that Jesus Christ really gave to us as a commandment that we would indeed be part of a company of believers that would be active in casting out demons, laying hands on people to receive their healings and, and also to be involved in, in the working of miracles. 